So welcome to the Laws and Conventions panel. Our first speaker is Dominika Brzezinska from the Institute of Medieval Studies at the University of St Andrews. And she will be speaking us today, to us today about sibling bonds between bastards and non-bastards in land litigations in 13th century England, some case studies. So Dominika, if you would like to share your screen, um, the floor is yours. Uh, so thank you for the introduction. Um, and uh, just uh, before I start, can you all see my screen now? Yes, we can. All right. Um, so um, my today's uh, paper is a part of my uh, PhD project, uh, which hopefully um, will be submitted in a few months. And um, I will present a short uh, study of four cases that um, took place before the Royal Court uh, in 13th century England. All our land litigation where the rights to the disputed territories were based on the aspects of legitimacy of the parties involved. All were disputes between siblings. Due to the type of the source, which is records of legal cases over inheritance rights, the material presented will focus mainly on the tensions and conflicts that divided the families and negatively influenced mutual relations within. First, however, I would like to say a few words um, of, um, about the law concerning illegitimacy that was already in place in 13th century England. It is worth emphasizing that the secular law and canon law were not completely in agreement and um, that the discrepancies between those two existed and were significant. The inconsistency and antiquities were often used by the parties of the litigation to their own advantages and influence the verdict. The questions of illegitimate status in high medieval England was a complex problem due to the legal dichotomy between common and canon law regarding the definition of legitimacy as well as intermeshing competencies between those two parties. The main rule agreed by both was that an illegitimate person could not inherit after the parents. All disputes concerning the inheritance rights were preceded by the secular court. However, decision whether someone was legitimate or not belonged to the competence of the church. By simplest definition, accepted by the church, a bastard was a person born to parents who were not married to each other. The main difference between the common law practice uh, in England and canon law was the status of children born before marriage of their parent. The church considered matrimony as the legitimizing power, whereas the secular law continued to perceive those children illegitimate. Also from the perspective of the church, the actual paternity was important, whereas the secular approach to this issue was completely different, and it was rather difficult to bastardize a child by accusing one's spouse of adultery. The first litigation that I want to discuss today um, was proceeded in Buckinghamshire at the end of the 13th century, and uh, this uh, case reveals a rather interesting conflict between the younger brother on one side and his mother and the older brother on the other. The assize was to decide if late John um, de Kynes died seized of the man uh, manor of Milton Keynes, and if Nicholas, the plaintiff and his son, was his next heir. The manor in question was in that moment held uh, by Maud, who was John's wife. Maud requested to be represented before the court by Robert de Keynes, who also announced that he was elder brother of Nicholas, born of the same parents, and then he claimed entitlement to the same manor. In response, Nicholas denied Robert's rights, saying that he was not John, uh, John's son, but a son of Roger of Hanslop, and was born before any contract of marriage was made between Maud and John. Robert defended his rights and stated that he was a legitimate son of John and Maud and that he was brought up and raised with John in his house as his elder son. In answer to that, Nicholas repeated what he said before, adding that Robert was raised in Great Crowley and treated as Roger, 
uh, Roger's son long before John had married Maud and that he was known by the whole locality as uh, Roger's son. After the sides presented the version of the story, the court decided to summon the local sheriff, who was then obliged to produce 12 men who were to investigate the truth and to give their verdict during the next assembly. The chosen jurors decided that Robert was not treated as Roger's son, nor was he brought up in Great Crowley, and that John treated him as his son for the whole of his lifetime after he married Maud. Nevertheless, they also added that Robert was born 10 years before the marriage between John and Maud, and um, that Maud was, had impeded John in the church court for several years before he finally agreed to marry her. In this case, the verdict of the jury, surprisingly, was in favor of the elder brother, Robert. As for Nicholas, he was also a mess. There are a few aspects of this case worth emphasizing. First of all, the younger brother refused to acknowledge the older one as a son of his father, which also meant that he called into question the credibility and virtue of the mother. He also mentioned that they were not raised together, Actually, based on what was discovered and acknowledged by the jurors, uh, his version of the past could have a semblance of truth. Robert was born 10 years before the solemn marriage took place and before John acknowledged him as his son. The assumption that as an infant, Robert was kept with a different family is not without a reason. The verdict of the jury is surprisingly uh, surprising though. One of the aims of the assize was to decide if the younger brother should be considered his father closest heir. Although the jurors established that the older brother was not born in a local marital union, which rendered him illegitimate as per common, uh, common law, it was the younger brother who lost the dispute and had to pay a fine. Quite a similar case took place in Lincoln um, a few decades earlier. Uh, this um, litigation was over the patrimony between a pair of alleged brothers, Bartholomew and Osbert, sons of Richard. Osbert said that before the court that he was the firstborn son of his father and that Bartholomew was not his brother, as he was not a son of Richard. He added also that Bartholomew was born and nurtured in the home of Robert of Craig and was treated as his brother. In turn, Bartholomew argued that it was him who was the firstborn son of Richard and his legal wife, and that Os Osbert was his younger brother. He also added that he was born in the house of Richard, his father, and raised there for half a year until his grandmother told Richard that Bartholomew, Bartholomew was not a son of him. Of his. Then he was sent to be nurtured to the mother of Fulco Bainard and never returned to his father. The court asked him how the grandmother had become suspicious of him, and he said he did not know. When asked what he did um, right after the death of Richard and whether he offered a homage to his feudal role, the Count of Clare, Bartholomew answered that he was then in the service of, Rob, uh, of Roger Le Bigot. Osbert admitted that it could be that they were the sons of the same mother, but Bartholomew was born before her marriage to Richard, and he believed that his true father was Bartholomew of Craig. He also added that his father had never acknowledged Bartholomew as his son. In this case, the illegitimate Bartholomew lost the dispute. The third case uh, <clears throat> is an example of legal dispute where the accusation of illegitimacy was based on adulterous deeds of the wife. It was proceeded in Essex at the first half of the 13th century. Four knights were summoned to record and provide the judgment in the trial between uh, William, the son of Richard, and Robert de Wimbish, um, who himself was either a younger brother of William or his cousin. The land in question was at first a season of Robert, William's uncle. Because Robert did not have any children, his brother Richard was considered first in line to his heirdom. By hereditary law, William, as a son and rightful heir, inherited the rights to the disputed lands after Richard. Robert O. Wimbish refused to answer to William's claim as he said that it should not be him respond to, uh, to respond to that as there is an older brother named William Lenevu 
who had greater right in the tenement as he was the firstborn son. In response, first William, uh, later on I will uh, call him the younger, contradicted uh, arguing that William Lenevu, although was indeed his brother, was not born in a lawful marriage, but his birth was a result of fornication as their mother had openly lived with another man after a marriage contract between her and Richard uh, took place. Therefore, William continued, he had the greatest right in the, dispute, uh, land, uh, in the disputed land as a rightful heir to all tenements that his father held until his death. Then Robert objected again, repeating that he would not respond to the writ as there was the firstborn brother, namely William Neville. The claims were made and lines of the conflict drawn. And the question that needed to be answered by the four knights who were chosen jurors of this assize was, which William had stronger right to Richard Erdogan? Their answer was that as Neville was born of fornication and it, it was William son of Richard, who was the, uh, it was the William son of Richard who was the closest heir. But it was not the end of this dispute because Robert of Wimbish disagreed with the verdict and he summoned a certain free man named John as a witness who verbally confirmed that William Lenevu should have uh, proceedings over William the Younger. In turn, William, uh, his opponent did the same and presented another free man, Nicholas uh, de Turdego, so he could give testimony in his favor. Both parties were also ready to solve this dispute through a duel. The duel never uh, happened though, as at the same time William Lenevue appeared in person before the jurors in the Westminster and declared himself legitimate and born within a lawful marriage, which uh, he was ready to prove. It was then decided that, the, that William Lenevu would prove his legitimacy before the ecclesiastical court. Robert agreed that unless William Lenevu provided his legitimacy within a time frame, approved his legitimacy within a time frame granted to him by the Curia Regis, William, the son of Richard, will recover his season within a duel, without a duel. Inquiry was sent to the Bishop of London who in his statement declared William de Lenevu not legitimate. In result, William the Younger recovered uh, the tenements and Robert lost the dispute. In short summary, this case is between brothers, both born within a marriage, but one as a result of adultery. As the question of legitimacy was sent to the court Christian, which had a different approach than English common law, to the problem of um, adulterous children, William Lenevu was declared illegitimate and lost the case. Should this case be proceeded within the jurisdiction of secular court only, the verdict probably could have been different. The last um, case that I wanted to mention today took place in Wiltshire in the middle of the 13th century. The land uh, litigation was between two brothers, Ralph and Robert Cole, before the county court. Ralph, the plaintiff, demanded to be given a half virgate of land, of land in Dantington as his hereditary right after his late father, Robert. His opponent, and at the same time, his elder brother, also named Robert, denied rights to that land for both Ralph and his father. The court decided to proceed the case as a grand assize and elected 12 knights to make a recognition. Ralph protested against the grand assize by claiming that Robert and he were brothers born of one father, but con contrary to his elder brother, he was born in the lawful wedlock and as such should inherit the, the land. Robert denied the alleged rights of Ralph, explaining that their father was seized of that land as of fee and that he enlofed him of it, of it by his charter. Ralph acknowledged the charter, but argued that because their father died seized of that land, his brother had never been uh, seized of the land by the charter during the life of their parent. The uh, response of the jurors was that Robert, the father, had not died seized of that land in question, but 
He, in fact, engulfed Robert, his son, and made the corresponding charter long before his death. In consequence, Ralph lost this land litigation to his illegitimate brother. This case illustrates the situation when the father wanted to substantially support his bastard son, which, as it turned out, was against the younger legitimate son. Um, in short summary, the legal dispute revealed that the argument of illegitimate sta status was often a calculated move aimed at providing material benefits, even if it's made as the expense of closest family members, a sibling or a parent, and even if it meant the reputational damage and my losing the family bond. Thank you. Thank you, Dominica. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, and it sounds like it was really quite fun and juicy to researchers as well. So <laughs> I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions about that later. Um, so next we have Hazel Vosper from Lancaster University, um, who is giving us a talk titled, Who Do You Trust? A Case Study of a Victorian Marriage Settlement from Between the Married Women's Property Acts. And um, so Hazel, over to you. Sorry, can you see my screen okay? Yes, we can, thanks. Okay, let me just... Okay, uh, good afternoon, everybody. During most of the 19th century in England, a woman lost legal personality upon entering into marriage. In the eyes of the law, a single or widowed woman known as a femme sole was recognized as having legal personality. A femme sole could own and manage all types of property, which covers all types of financial assets, and could enter into contracts in her own right. A married woman known as a femme covet could not do these things because in the eyes of the law, she was covered by the legal personality of her husband. This was due to the common law doctrine of coverture. Sorry, I've just realized my uh, video is off, in case you want to see me reading. Uh, marriage settlements were a legal contract established between the two parties prior to a wedding. One of their benefits was that they provided a means for the woman about to be married to maintain a financial interest in certain aspects, regardless, uh, assets, sorry, regardless of coverture. Whether a marriage settlement actually protected a married woman from a rapacious husband was challenged at the time by judges and reform campaigners such as John Stuart Mill, and it has remained a topic of debate for scholars subsequently. What is less contested is that marriage settlements were fairly common for middle and upper class women in the 19th century, evidenced by the fact that many examples can be found in the archives. Coverture was recognised by common law that marriage settlements were a private contract and, uh, recognized under equity law and adjudicated in the Court of Chancery. Prior to a wedding, the bride-to-be, at that point still a femme sole, could enter into a marriage settlement contract out of which a legal structure called a trust was established. I'm going to give you a very brief description of how trusts work. Um, this is um, very, very simplified. They're quite complex or can be. So there's three parties to a trust. The first one is the settler. And these are the people who set up the whole um, trust um, and they transfer legal title. They give up ownership of assets and put them into the protection, the boundaries of the trust. And they document their instructions in a settlement deed. So this might be a father of a bride. The trustees are appointed to oversee the trust. They have legal control over the assets and they have a fiduciary responsibility to the beneficiary. This means they have to do their best, always act in the best interest of the beneficiaries. Their responsibilities are set out in the settlement deed. Then we have the beneficiaries. They receive the benefit from the assets, but they're not the asset owners. And often, as I'll talk about, the beneficiaries uh, went across multiple generations. One settlement from 1875 anchors this paper. This case is not exceptional per se. It did not end up before the Court of Chancery and there were no known trustee issues. Rather, it is presented as a case study from a period of significant change for married women. In 1870, a Married Women's Property Act was enacted. 
Uh, and here we've got the basic um, uh, parts of this act. It was actually quite minimalist in what it did. Um, it would gave rights such as if a woman um, earned wages in her own right, separate from a husband, she could keep them. It gave her ownership over certain amounts of personal property when she married. Um, but it was a bit confusing because there was quite a few distinctions made between what applied to women married before or after 1870. Although the parliamentary debates and commentary in the press leading up to this act had been wide ranging and quite ambitious, its final scope was relatively narrow after the House of Lords substantially watered down the original provisions. Following the 1870 Act, the press continued to highlight inequities and reformers continued to lobby for more extensive property rights. As a consequence, a more substantive act followed in 1882. And here, what we see is married women could basically act as if they were still femme souls instead of femme coverts. They could own all types of property, they could hold the income um, from lots of sources and they could enter into contracts in their own right. So it was a much more substantive uh, change. The case presented in this paper falls between the dates of these two acts. Anne Elizabeth Stead was born in Carlisle. In May 1875, at the age of 21, Anne married James Davidson, aged 36, and a head partner in a local bank in the local parish church at Stanix. So Stanix is just to the north of Carlisle in the north of England. In anticipation of their forthcoming wedding, Anne and James entered into a marriage settlement. And here we can see the settlement deed between them and this uh, signatures, Stead and Davidson. It's about A4 a in height, but it falls out. Both families contributed money into the settlement, £1,900 from her side, £600 from his. The investees were required to invest this money only into assets authorised under the settlement deed. So here we can see that they could put money into shares and government securities for the UK, India and the colonies, to real estate, and into corporation and municipal securities such as issued by Birmingham, Leeds, the big cities. Um, but if it wasn't in those three categories, they couldn't invest. The terms of the deed stated that Anne would have separate use, that is, she would be the sole beneficiary of all the income generated from the capital trust, from the capital held in trust until her death. The likelihood of Anne or James dying early within their marriage was high. In the mid 19th century, there's a one in five chance that a marriage would end with the death of one spouse within 10 years of their marriage. Widowers tended to remarry more readily than widows, with remarriage of either giving rise to the possibility of a second family needing to be considered with regard to the trust. The extent to which uh, James and Anne were involved in the administration of the trust was defined in the deed. The responsibilities, oh, sorry, uh, the, in the deed, the responsibility of this trust was similarly defined. And as will be discussed, these often extended to potentially quite intrusive involvement in the lives of the beneficiaries. If issues arose, either side could seek remedy at the Court of Chancery. So the deed gives the instructions of how the trust is to be run on behalf of the beneficiaries, initially the Davidsons, overseen by the trustees. And if they had a falling out, everybody went off to the Court of Chancery. Three key areas will now be explored to highlight the level of interconnection between the beneficiaries and trustees, covering the appointment of trustees, access to trust capital, and final disposal of trust assets. So appointing trustees. The primary criterion to be a trustee was that if a person could hold property, then they were eligible. Women could be trustees, although this was less common. An 1878 law manual between the two acts reflects the limited nature of the first Married Women's Property Act, when it suggests that although a married woman could be appointed as a trustee, quote, she is not a suitable person for the office due to her legal disabilities and incidents, end quote. The role of the trustee could be complex and finding a suitable candidate to take on the burden was difficult. They received no payments, the work could be time, time consuming, and there was a risk of having to defend actions in court. Keeping abreast of trustee responsibilities could be difficult. A steady progression of judgments emerged from the 
Court of Chancery on cases con concerning tangled family matters or challenges to the suitability of trust investments. Parliament also passed a succession of act related to trusts and in 1895 a parliamentary select committee was formed to specifically review trust administration. Trustees were not necessarily chosen for their business or financial acumen. Ties of friendship or community duty were often of greater importance. Under the terms of the deed, Anne and James could jointly make an appointment of a trustee. Initially, two were selected, Thomas Wright and Thomas Whitfield Gladstone. Thomas Wright was a solicitor at, the Wright and at Wright and Brown of Carlisle, the law firm that drew up the Stead Davidson Trust deed. He lived in the same Stanix district as the Stead fa family and was the brother of the second wife of Anne's father. Owing to the family connection and his professional qualifications, Thomas Wright might have been an obvious choice. It is less apparent why Thomas Whitfield Gladstone was chosen as a trustee. At the time the trust was established, he was only 27, living with his parents in Birmingham and working with his father as a wine merchant. The, the appointment of a suitable trustee was very important. They not only had to be able to manage the trust capital, but they might also be called upon to make important personal decisions affecting individual family members. And here we turn to the second area, access to trust capital. The trustees had the authority to make payments from the cap trust capital to individual beneficiaries if the money was to be used for the benefit of a child. These so-called maintenance and advancement clauses were common and were intended to be used for actions such as the funding of education, army commissions or emigration assistance. Requests for advancement payments could give rise to some of the most difficult decisions for trustees to deal with, potentially leading to disagreements amongst themselves or with the beneficiaries. As the 1895 Select Committee was to highlight, this was an area potentially requiring, quote, a good deal of discretion as to the circumstances attending the advancement, the particular position that the son is going to take and the advancement received beforehand to fit him for it. The trustees could only use the trust capital according to the terms of the deed, and they did not require the permission of the beneficiaries. Asset sales and purchases had been made easier by the move away from the ownership of land and real estates to fung fung fungible assets such as shares. One consequence was that trust transactions could be undertaken without public scrutiny. This was a temptation that some trustees found too much. Unlawful use of trust money can be found in court cases, and it served as a dramatic plot device for writers such as Trollope. Trustees often had to carefully balance the needs of the first generation of, a trust, of trust beneficiaries against those of future generations. The wife or husband in a marriage settlement might want a safe and reliable income stream. In contrast, their children might prefer investments with a high level of risk and therefore potential return to bolster the trust capital that they hope to inherit. And here we turn to the third area, the final disposal of trust assets. As, been, as has been noted, a significant benefit of marriage settlements was to ensure that a woman was supported financially if she was widowed. Children also had to be provided for, which could be complicated if one or more of the parties to the original settlement were to have had, had children with another partner. The terms of the Stead Davison trust deed attempted to anticipate all the different potential scenarios that might arise. While Anne was alive, she received all the income. But it is important to note that the limitations of the First Married Women's Property Act meant that James could still legally appropriate most of Anne's income once she'd received it, if he so wished. If Anne predeceased James, the trust income would go to James for the rest of his life. Although the trust capital was to be invested in the same way, the deed stressed that the two initial pots of money had to be kept separate. The reason for this becomes apparent once both had died and the existence of any children had to be considered. At the po point that both have died, but they had children, the remaining children that originated from the Stead family was to be ring-fenced as the Stead Fund, and the money from the Davidson Fund was to be ring-fenced as the Davidson Fund. 
The stead fund was to be used for any child of Anne, either from her marriage to James or with any other person. If any child had not reached the age of 21, the trustees were to use the stead fund for that child's maintenance, education and advancement. And once again, it is the trustees that have the responsibility for providing for children's advancement rather than a close family member. Once a child of Anne reached their majority, they would become eligible to a share of the Stead Fund, which was to be distributed equally between Anne's living children. The terms for the Davidson Fund were the same in relation to James's children. Where there is a difference is in the situation where Anne and James had no children. And this difference directly relates to their marriage settlement having been established prior to the Second Married Women's Women's Property Act, and as a consequence, the order of death would be critical. If James had died first, then Anne would have been left a widow. James' estate was to be disposed of as per the instructions in his will, and as a widow, and therefore with her legal personality restored as a femme sole under common law, Anne would have likewise given instructions for the disposal of what remained of her property through her will. If Anne predeceased her husband, most of her property that he had legally taken control of when they married would still be considered part of James's estate, which again he would dispose of through his estate. This reflects the limitation of the 1870 Married Women's Property Act, whereby Anne, as a femme covert, could still only own and therefore dispose of limited types of property. Um, so um, in this case, um, uh, um, James would have had Anne's property and she would just be left without it. But we need to remember that the assets in the Stead Fund were a matter of equity. So the deed term stated directly that if Anne predeceased her husband, the Stead Fund was to be signed as per her will, but with the important stipulation of notwithstanding coverture. Common law was still the forefront when deciding what constituted the types of property that Anne could directly own and therefore what she could dispose of. But the stipulation notwithstanding coverture served to emphasize for the avoidance of any doubt equity's primacy over common law with regard to the specific disposal of the stead fund assets held for Anne within the protection of this trust. In the event the stipulation was not required as Anne outlived James, he died from consumption only six years after the marriage, uh, leaving their three children in Anne's and the trustee's care. Anne was to live until the age of 90. She never remarried. So finally, in conclusion, the title of this paper is Who Do You Trust? An obvious play on the use of the word trust either as a noun, as in a legal trust, or as a verb, as in to trust someone. The decision to enter into a marriage settlement during the period between the two Married Women's Property Acts would have needed to consider this very question. Was there an expectation that the legal momentum from 1870 would continue and that Parliament could be trusted to match its rhetoric with a more radical law than the House of, that the House of Lords would actually pass? If not, the need for a marriage settlement would continue, accompanied by the need to establish a network of potentially long-term relationships based on interpersonal trust, albeit underpinned by equity law. A high level of trust would be placed in the trustees to both effectively uh, manage uh, capital for the benefit of multiple generations and potentially to make decisions that would directly influence the life chances of Anne and James's children. Each trustee had to trust that the settler had established a comprehensive deed, anticipating the possible future scenarios that might occur within the beneficiary's lives. The trustees would be exposed to reputational damage, monetary loss, and possibly worse, if they lost the tr trust of the beneficiaries who might seek remedy in the court of chancery for actual or perceived mismanagement. Beneficiaries had to trust each other not to seek undue influence with the trustees or through the courts in order to gain an advantage over another's prospects. And all this at a time when just seven years later, the Second Married Women's Property Act would obviate the need for much of what the Stead Davidson Marriage Settlement was established to protect against. Thank you. Thank you, Hazel. That was an absolutely beautiful case study of the complexities um, of marriage settlements. That was, that was absolutely stunning. Um, again, 
questions at the end. So we'll move on uh, for now to Hannah Telling um, from the Institute of Historical Research, who will be talking to us today about living as man and wife, cohabiting couples and fatal violence in Scotland between 1850 and 1914. So Hannah, if you'd like to begin. Lovely, thanks everyone. I'm just going to set up my PowerPoint. Can you see that? Yes, we can. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, so hi, everyone. Um, it's great to be here today. Um, the paper today is part of a wider piece of research with a colleague, hopefully culminating in an article that looks at judicial and cultural responses to cohabitation in Scotland from 1560 to pretty much the um, current, pretty much modern day. But today I'm going to be focusing specifically on cohabiting unmarried couples in the context of fatal violence prosecutions in Scotland between 1850 and 1914. So to start, um, in October 1869, Thomas Diaz, an Irish labourer, pleaded guilty to the culpable homicide of Helen Hall, a woman whom he had lived with for a number of years in Glasgow. In an effort to mitigate his inevitable prison sentence at trial, Thomas argued that he had been provoked into his violent actions by Helen's behaviour. Thomas alleged that on arriving, that on, um, sorry, on the afternoon of the fatal assault, he had given Helen his wages to purchase provisions. Yet upon arriving home that evening, he found no dinner prepared for him and that Helen had used his money to get drunk with her sister and a female friend. This, argued Thomas, provoked the fatal violence that followed. Mr. Lorimer, Thomas's defence lawyer, argued in court that, and I quote, the attack had been made under circumstances of considerable irritation and anger without premeditation, and as the medical evidence would have shown, its duration must have been a matter of seconds, not minutes. Mr. Lorimer was here making the case to the presiding judge that this was an incident that could be dealt with with relative leniency. A homicide provoked by the unreasonable conduct of the now deceased, yes. A cold-blooded murder, no. The judge, Lord Neves, seemingly agreed. Thomas's plea was accepted and he received a sentence of just 18 months imprisonment. In certain ways, this case followed a familiar pattern seen in numerous prosecutions of spousal homicide in 19th century Scotland, whereby allegations of provocative, unwifely behaviour were put forward by husbands trying to mitigate the perceived severity of their violence at trial. Yet what is particularly interesting about this case is that despite living together as man and wife, cohabiting and reputed as spouses within the community, Thomas and Helen had never formally married. This fact and the cultural opprobrium attached to their marital status by their higher class contemporaries did not go unmentioned at trial. Lord Neves, the presiding judge stated that, it was clear that prisoner and deceased had been living a wicked and miserable life. And yet despite this, Lord Neves emphasized that it was of no consequence in his eyes that Hall was not the prisoner's wife. She was as much entitled to his protection as though their connection had received the sanctity of law. So this paper today explores judicial and cultural responses to fatal violence between unmarried cohabiting couples in Scotland between 1850 and 1914. And I aim to show two things. First, that these forms of sexual relationships were seemingly not that uncommon and that legal records of murder prosecutions offer a near unique glimpse into the diversity of sexual relationships in primarily urban working class communities. Second, that in cases of fatal violence between cohabiting couples, the cultural performance of marriage was of paramount importance. While simply living as man and wife did not mean that a couple were recognized in law as spouses, there was a cultural expectation that by cohabiting as if married, both parties conform to behaviours expected within a formally sanctioned marital union. So at this stage, it's necessary to briefly outline the systems and processes of marriage in Scotland. Scotland was unique in Western Europe in according legal validity to irregular marriage until comparatively recently. After the Scottish Reformation of 1560, marriage ceased to be a sacrament, instead falling under Kirk or church uh, and secular jurisdictions. As consent alone, whether express or tacit, was the main concern of Scots law in terms of establishing a valid marriage, both regular and irregular forms of marriage were permitted in Scotland. A regular marriage, what could be termed marriage by celebration, 
involved a public proclamation of a promise to marry termed the reading of the bans, followed by a ceremony presided over by a Kirk minister. Irregular marriages were treated with more suspicion, but were still considered valid in certain circumstances. And there were three main forms of irregular marriage, marriage by declaration, marriage by promise, and marriage by cohabitation with habit and repute. This final category established that a valid marriage could be inferred by the continued cohabitation of the parties as man and wife, and I quote, with the repute among all who know them that such is their relation. Yet both regular and irregular forms of marriage required that both parties be free to marry in the first place. And one of the most common impediments to marriage for cohabiting couples in this period was that one or both of the parties had a living spouse who they had separated from, but not divorced. Furthermore, despite its theoretical validity, irregular marriage was treated with apprehension by legal authorities. And as Eleanor Gordon argues, after civil registration was introduced in 1855, unregistered irregular marriages were often regarded by the authorities as illicit cohabitation and concubinage. With the cohabiting couples that I'm interested in, there is a, a degree of ambiguity as to the precise nature of their relationships. In some cases, one or both of the individuals were still married to, they separated from another person. Other cases may well have been irregular marriages that remained unregistered and thus lacked official sanction. What can be stated, however, is that in broad terms, cohabitation refers to a couple who live together in a long-term relationship that resembled marriage, but which lacked formal recognition. And these unsanctioned unions were surprisingly common, particularly in the context of prosecutions for fatal violence. Between 1850 and 1914, there were 222 murder prosecutions in Scotland involving the death of an individual allegedly at the, at the hands of their sexual partner. And this includes regularly and irregularly married spouses, unmarried cohabiting couples, mistresses and courting sweethearts. Now, of these 222 cases, 28 involve couples who were cohabiting as man and wife, as reputed spouses, but who had not either regularly married or seemingly registered an irregular marriage. Therefore, 12.6% of prosecutions for intimate partner homicide, as we might term it, involved unmarried couples who behaved and performed as if they were married. And the extent to which this proportion of unmarried cohabiting couples was representative for 19th century Scottish society as a whole is practically impossible to gauge. Working class cohabiting couples who lived harmoniously together presumably existed, but left little evidence of their lives in the historical record. Indeed, it is only because the cases I'm exploring involved an instance of prosecuted fatal violence that we can explore these relationships in any detail at all. But whilst perhaps not representative of Scottish society as a whole, these cases do provide insight into the arrangements, obligations, diversity and complexity of non-normative sexual relationships in 19th century Scotland. But let us take, for example, the prosecution of James Ritchie for the murder of Elizabeth Wilson Matheson or Gilmore in 1907. The pretrial documents in this case revealed that Elizabeth, then aged 12, lived with a lad named, named Henry McCaffrey for a period of five years. In 1903, then aged 18, Elizabeth married Hugh Gilmore, who had fathered her illegitimate child, born a few months before their marriage. Two years later, Elizabeth had separated from her husband and was again cohabiting with Henry McCaffrey. Henry stated in his deposition that, and I quote, Elizabeth and I were living together during that time as man and wife. Yet, whilst Elizabeth was cohabiting with Henry at the time of her death, she was also engaging in a sexual relationship of some form with James Ritchie, the man charged with and ultimately convicted of her murder. Ritchie alleged at trial that he had contracted a venereal disease from Elizabeth and that he, and I quote, did the deed in a passion and when he was very drunk. In a case that the presiding judge characterized as a squalid tragedy in one of the lowest strata of Glasgow life, Ritchie was unanimously convicted of murder, though later awarded a reprieve of execution on account of his youth. Legal records of fatal violence between cohabiting couples also shed light on the cultural performance and expectations attached to these unsanctioned unions. 
in pre-trial court documents and newspaper reporting of murder trials, we can trace ways in which these pseudo husbands and wives were expected to conform to behaviors traditionally associated with individuals bound by a formal marriage contract. In the case I opened with, Thomas Dears argued that the drunkenness of his partner and her misappropriation of the wages he had given her for the household provoked his fatal violence. In this way, he presented an argument for mitigation that was usually reserved for spousal relationships. In spousal homicide cases, some forms of mitigation, some forms of provocation argued in mitigation were neither gender nor relationship specific. A wife, for example, might provoke her husband by physical violence or threats, just as a man might provoke another man. But other types of provocation, for example, drunkenness and the resultant neglect of domestic and maternal duties or sexual unfaithfulness were specific to the spousal relationship. And whilst provocation as grounds for admissible mitigation in instances of non-spousal homicide was quite restrictively and narrowly defined in Scots law, there was more ambiguity as to what constituted provocation within the context of marital relationships. The result was that juries were often reticent to convict provoked husbands on the capital offence of murder, and that in some cases, um, acquit men were acquitted by juries accused of killing their allegedly disorderly, drunken or transgressive wives against the advice and even direction of judges. And we can trace this same dynamic um, occurring in murder prosecutions between unmarried cohabiting couples. In an 1864 prosecution, Peter Blair was accused of fatally stabbing his partner, Jesse Noble or Gordon, who he had lived with for 10 years as man and wife. Peter alleged in his defense that Jesse was frequently drunk, had used violence towards him on at least one occasion, and that it was rumored she had been unfaithful to him as well. Despite the fact that they were unmarried, this defense, founded on principles that usually applied to formerly married spouses, was seemingly effective. Prior to the jury's deliberation, the presiding judge stated that the character of the prisoner, and I quote, contrasted favorably with that of the deceased, a consideration which they ought to keep in view. Accordingly, the jury convicted Blair of the non-capital offense of culpable homicide rather than the capital offense of murder. Women who cohabited with men as reputed wives were expected to adhere to the defined notions of femininity and domesticity that characterized women's gender roles within formal marriages. Yet this cultural expectation of proper spousal conduct and obligations within cohabiting relationships had another dimension. When responding to instances of fatal violence between cohabiting couples, judges often made the point that by living together as man and wife, men were held to the same obligations as husbands were to protect their female partner. Addressing Peter Blair while sentencing him to 15 years penal servitude for the killing of his partner, Jesse, Lord Need stated that, and I quote, you have been found guilty of a very bad crime, of stabbing a woman who stood in the relation to you almost of your wife, a relation which, if you chose to enter it, should have protected her from your hands certainly more than any other creature. Likewise, in 1870, when William Cunningham was convicted of the murder of his partner, Julian McLean, with whom he had lived as man and wife, the presiding judge, the Lord Justice Clark, contended that, though she was not your wife, she deserved at your hands at least kindness and protection. So to conclude, I've hopefully demonstrated, albeit briefly, two things today. First, that in the context of fatal violence prosecutions in Scotland between 1850 and 1914, a surprisingly significant proportion of intimate partner homicides involved couples who lived together as man and wife, but whose unions lacked either formal certification and registration, or else were illicit in the sense that one or both of the parties were not free to marry or remarry. Further, that exploring cohabitation in the context of murder prosecutions can provide a near unique insight into non-normative sexual relationships in this period, particularly amongst urban working class individuals. And then finally, by exploring both the defenses presented by individuals accused of murdering their partners and judges' responses to these instances of fatal violence, I hope to have shown that the cultural performance of marriage was of paramount importance. The act of living as man and wife was not accorded the same social capital as a legally recognized union, but there was a prevalent expectation that by cohabiting as if married, 
both parties were expected to conform to gendered marital obligations. Fatal violence between cohabiting unmarried couples and fatal violence between legally married spouses was dealt with in remarkably similar ways. Something I would argue reveals that marriage was not simply a legal contract, but a mechanism of cultural performance. Thanks very much for listening. I will stop sharing my screen now. Thank you very much, Hannah. That was that was wonderful, if harrowing. Um, <laughs> that was again, that was absolutely fascinating. Thank you. Um, finally, before we get to the questions, our last speaker um, of this panel is Taylor O'Kan from the University of Exeter. And today he will be giving a talk uh, titled To Play the Football and Banquet, All Money, Hen Silver and Communal Marriage Dues in Pre-Modern Britain. So Taylor, the floor is yours. Thanks for having me. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Great. All right. Uh, so, on the 4th of March in 1409, eight men stood trial at the mayor's court in the Guildhall of London. They were ordered to never again collect money for football or something called cock silver for poultry, nor to thresh or cudgel um, such cocks, hens, capons, or any other birds in the streets of the city. Now, both football and the cruel threshing of poultry were popular sports on Shrove Tuesday, which is a holiday that had taken place about two weeks prior to the trial. Now, about a month after this trial, right before Easter, the London mayor issued the following proclamation, which stated that, quote, no person, person shall levy money or cause it to be levied for the games called football and cock threshing because of marriages that have recently taken place in the said city. Now, although a direct causal link cannot be confirmed between the court case and this proclamation, it seems likely that the first prompted the second and that together they reflect a particular set of interrelated medieval cultural practices. Now, more precisely, these cultural practices involved the communal collection of a ball or football, food and drink, or some monetary equivalent to these from recently married couples either during the wedding festivities themselves or at a customary occasion like Shrovetide or Easter. Known by various names like ball money, boss siller, ball, the bride ball and the football do on the one hand and hen silver, hen drinking silver and the peri on the other. These customs were found across a considerable geographic and temporal range. Spanning the British Isles, parts of Northern France and Northern Germany from as early as the 13th century down to the present day. These communal marriage dues took many forms and evolved over time. They could be loose and informal or highly ceremonial and institutionalized at the level of the manor, parish, guild, or civic corporation. Dues could be given happily or begrudgingly, but the consequence of refusing them could be dire. That's this last point, this exacting and sometimes menacing nature, plus the pairing of communal entertainment with communal regulation of the marital household, which connects ball money and the like to a larger family of pre-modern European customs called rough music or charavari. This is a well-known and often studied set of customs by social historians of popular culture. Um, and it has been usefully categorized by medievalist and folklorist Tom Pettit, who's actually, I think, in our audience today. It's good to have you here. He's categorized them into two broad categories. Um, one, rituals performed in response to specific domestic or sexual transgressions in established households. And two, rituals performed at and because of weddings. In other words, at the formation of new households. Now, the most famous kind of this second nuptial type of charabari um, castigated or shamed mismatched couples like um, widows and um, young and old couples who were getting married. But customs like ball money fit into this second nuptial type as well. 
for in many places, all newlyweds, and not just those transgressing norms, were subject to communal hazing rituals, which had to be paid off with money, food, or entertainment. These kinds of all wedding sharavaris or exactions were rarely overtly malicious, which is perhaps why they have received slightly less historiographical attention than their more sensational counterparts. So in this presentation, I'll try to make a start at giving these exaction customs their due, focusing in particular on British ball money. I'll first briefly survey the known evidence of ball money and other closely related practices, starting with the 19th and 20th centuries when the examples are uh, most varied and plentiful and working backwards in time to assemble a more complete picture. Um, I'll then draw some initial conclusions about ball money and what it could tell us about marriage, play, and commonwealth in pre-modern British societies. So 18th and 19th century antiquarians and folklorists were the first to diligently collect and record references to ball money as a distinct and informal folk practice. In 1777, clergyman John Brand wrote of the custom in his extensive and influential observations on popular antiquities referring to his native Newcastle upon Tyne, quote, at present a party always attend here at the church gates after a wedding to demand the bridegroom money for a football. This claim admits of no refusal. The second edition of Brand's work published in 1813 after his death added that the custom was also found among the coal mining communities of Northern England and that it directly paralleled customs practiced in Normandy. Various English sources from later in the century place ball money traditions specifically in Northumberland, Durham, Yorkshire, Cheshire, Staffordshire, and the Lake District. North of the border, Jameson's Scottish Dictionary of 1825 defined ball as, quote, money given to schoolboys by a marriage company as being designed for the purchase of a ball, most probably a football. Now, this general definition of the custom fit the bill for much of rural Scotland, though there were variances in terminology and practicalities. In 19th and early 20th century Orkney, for example, quote, the barn door was besieged by a crowd of boys shouting for bar money, while the wedding company partook of refreshments, end quote. Newlywed couples were similarly expected to supply a ball for the annual community match in Creef, Perthshire, and throughout much of the Northeast Scotland, Rural weddings were incomplete without a chorus of cries for boss siller on the way to the minister's house and a scattering of coins from the groomsmen's pockets. This is a tradition vividly depicted in Elgin native John Grant's book, The Penny Wedding, which was published in 1836. Now, though football seems to have been the favored due in much of Scotland and Northern England, money for food and drink could also be demanded from newlyweds crucially in addition and outside the parameters of the wedding feast and wedding party. In his history of Wharton Parish, Lancashire, John Lucas provides some early 18th century evidence of drink money and football money coexisting. He explained that after the ceremony, the bridegroom would have to pay the village school, school boys to untie the church gate, which is barring their path. If refused, they would take the new bride's shoe as payment instead. During the evening, other villagers would also demand drink from the newly formed household. The two customs were thus slightly separate and happened at different times and places. But in both cases, the payment was in kind, or at least it was known what the cash payoff was supposed to represent, either entertainment or sustenance. Today, there are vestigial forms of these exactions surviving in what's known as wedding scrambles for coins in parts of Scotland, Yorkshire, and a couple of villages in Somerset. But over time, uh, the names describing what the coins were intended for, football, have been replaced with terms which describe the actions of collection or extraction or dispensing. So you get names like scatter or scramble or roping or tying the lich gate. Nonetheless, the original form and purpose of this custom is still preserved in parts of the Scottish borders, where balls for the annual Shrove Tuesday handball games are often donated by newlyweds or those with important wedding anniversaries that year. Evidence for ball money and other wedding exactions was widespread in Britain during the 18th through 20th centuries, but largely rural and informal in nature. Medieval and early modern records of the customs are far less numerous, but show the extent to which the marriage dues could be embedded in pre-modern institutions. 
At the level of Kirk and Parish in Scotland, for example, the Session Book of St. Magnus Cathedral in Kirkwall, Orkney, recorded in December 1684 that none in town and parish that marries but shall pay a football to the scholars of the grammar school. About 100 years before the, Kirk, the Kirkwall bylaw in 1583, the Presbytery of Dalkeith in Midlothian was far less friendly towards the Balmany customs of common folk. When, quote, diverse upland Kirks after marriages was troubled by the parent parishioners demanding footballs, they forbid such practices at any of their Kirks in the future. Moving out of the rural and religious context, the borough of Perth in Scotland offers our earliest known and most extensive set of records in that country related to football dues, spanning the 1530s into the 19th century. The oldest of these is a bylaw in the minute books of the Wright Corporation of the borough, dated to the 25th of March, 1538, and concerning the football and banquet. It required that each Wright Freeman Quote, the year he is married, give a football and, pain and banquet or be fined for 14 shilling Scots and his shop, shop shut up until payment. Indeed, all eight Perth trade incorporations required newly married freemen to pay for this combination of sport and feasting as part of their admissions during the early modern period with dues often collected on Shrove Tuesday. Strikingly similar to the football dues of these Perth trading corporations were those of the Freeman Marblers Company of Corf, Corf Castle down south in Dorset. The latter company met every show of Tuesday and in 1551 reconfirmed an old bylaw ordering that each Freeman quote, after his marriage shall pay into the wardings for the use and benefit of the company 12 pence and the last married man to bring a football according to the custom of our company. Staying in the urban context, but shifting to the level of civic corporation, early Tudor Chester also sponsored ball games through an embedded ball money custom. Every Shrove Tuesday in the early decades of the 16th century, the shoemakers brought a football, the saddlers brought a wooden ball, and every freeman from the city that was married since last Shrove Tuesday had to bring a small silk ball. And all of these were to be played for and won through the streets and common field of the city. Similarly, in Dublin, a civic assembly order issued in 1456 declared that any man dwelling within the city who was married should, quote, bear his ball on the Shrove Tuesday next ensuing. If he failed to do so, he would be fined 40 shillings to the mayor and bailiffs without any grace. The ball bearing procession continued from the 15th century until the early 17th, when the ceremony um, itself was gradually dissolved into a simple monetary due. Now, based on this overview of the evidence, it's clear that the ball money tradition was something of a spectrum. But what unites all of these exactions, the informal with the institutional, along with other all wedding charabaris found elsewhere in Europe, is the underlying idea that every newlywed owed something, often a very specific something, back to their community. For the Freeman Marblers of Court Castle, the football equated with the quote, use and benefits of the company. In Dublin, the fine paid in lieu of bearing a ball was earmarked specifically for, quote, the town works where that's most needful. In Chester, the married men's homages facilitated the, quote, public recreation of the whole city, while fines levied in dereliction of this duty went towards, quote, the use of the said city. The underlying rationale here was that play and festivity and football in particular were equivalent to the public good and the Commonwealth, and that it was the responsibility of a newlywed to contribute to that Commonwealth. Exactly why pre-modern communities felt that marriage warranted this toll is impossible to know for sure, because social meanings undoubtedly vary over place and time. Yet according to the scholar O.W. Farrer, writing in 1856, a recently married Freeman Marbler from Corf Castle paid his marriage shilling or football, quote, in acknowledgement of the right in case of his death of his widow to have an apprentice to work for her. Likewise, in 1830, an article from the Perthshire Advertiser queried, quote, if the widow be poor, has she not a right to the funds? Or why does her husband pay what is called a football? Is not this regarded as his wife's entry money? Now these could be read as post-enlightenment rationalizations of otherwise 
obscure folk customs. However, a bylaw from the Perth Baker Incorporation that can be dated to 1600 interprets the custom in the same way, stating that a freeman's ball was owed, quote, for the freedom of his wife to labor and occupy the said craft after his decease, end quote. Implied by these interpretations is that the act of marriage conveyed a potential burden upon a community, be it parish, guild, or city freedom. If the married man were to die, the community might be responsible for his widow and any orphans. In return for this potential risk, a one-time payment will be needed. Certainly the various corporations, guilds, parishes, and children that have been described thus far did not take such an obligation to facilitate football very lightly. A newlyweds fail failure to supply a football could resort variously in getting pelted with mud or insults, having the bride's shoe stolen, her dress ripped, heavy fines levied, imprisonment, or even having a shop closed down until payment was received. Ball money, with its extraordinary examples of inst institutionalization, may be particularly significant to the study of Sharabaris. For one, it does not fit neatly within the traditional interpretations of Sharabaris as reactions to scarcity in the marriage market, for example, or direct, direct reactions to moral transgressions. And it is certainly significant to the study of pre-modern sport and play, which is often compared unfavorably to post-industrial sport in terms of social value. For in the communal pension scheme that was ball money, play was equated with life itself. And out of the many types of play pre-modern people had to choose from, football rose to the top. So perhaps all the enthusiasm and passion we're witnessing around Euro 2020 right now has very deep roots indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Taylor. I really enjoyed that link uh, to your 2021, hmm. I guess, isn't it, at the end? Yeah. Um, <laughs> nicely done. Thanks. <laughs> so we are now basically at five o'clock. So I would like to thank you all um, for presenting uh, and also for, for people asking the questions. That was absolutely fascinating stuff. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Jenny Hyde, who, who is in the background here and who has been organizing all of this um, and, and making all of sure that the technical stuff works. Um, but thank you all, that was absolutely fascinating. Um, that was a really, really exciting two hours, I think, of kind of really quite interesting research about how, again, legal records can uncover all of this wonderful hidden stuff. So I think that, that we will end here, but if everybody wants to do a round of applause, because there will be a few of us, that would be really lovely, I think. So thank you all. <laughs>